Welcome everyone. We're getting our communication linked up. Um, uh, so, uh, welcome. This is a, a special uh, council meeting um, on Tuesday, October 9, 2018, located at the Veterans Memorial Hall. We're starting at 4.30, and our special meeting agenda item is for our One Water Plan update and provide direction and comments as deemed appropriate. Um, for the record, all members of council are present, and we'll call the meeting to order. And um, and with that, uh, we only have one item on the agenda. On the agenda, so we'll call for public comment for this item. For anybody who would like to speak, seeing none, I'll close public comment and bring it back to council and uh, look for. I think we're looking for a couple folks to get started on this. I'm, st I'm opening the meeting on time, and so do I need to open the meeting in time and then just recess for a few minutes? It looks like we're going to recess for a few minutes. Okay, so um, open the meeting at, at 4.30. We'll just make one. Okay, it looks like we, okay. All right, it looks like we're all, we're all here. And I didn't have any stories to tell while we were doing that, so. Do we need to load up any of the presentation, Rob? Eric's not here. We're ready to go? Um, Mr. Caceres is uh, not here yet. Let me okay. check to see where. So uh, um, we can take a five minute recess then? We'll, we'll take a five minute recess and get the presentation. Okay. Is Thank that you. good? Okay. Pardon us, folks. We'll take a five minute pre uh, recess and get going on and come back in a minute. Thank you. Welcome back from our short recess, and um, we will now um, get back to our meeting. And uh, just to review, um, this is a special meeting of City Council um, uh, for a one water plan update and the opportunity for Council to provide direction and comments as deemed appropriate. And with that, we'll turn it over to our staff to introduce the item and give us an update. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is a, a presentation of an interim director interim deliverable on the one water plan. Um, we'll be coming back to you um, next month with the um, final version of this report and uh, looking for council to adopt this. I'm going to turn it over to um, Eric Caceres, our um, project manager for the one water plan. And he's going to go through a, a presentation to uh, bring council up to date and uh, then we will take your comments and questions to be incorporated into the final um, report. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Um, Mr. Mayor, Council uh, staff, uh, Eric Caceres with Corolla Engineers, as Rob mentioned, um, the project manager for the city's one water plan. So I'm here tonight to provide an update on the one water plan. As Rob mentioned, um, we have an interim deliverable, um, nearly a complete draft of the one water plan um, ready, and we'll be coming back to you shortly with a, a final one water plan. At the end of the presentation, I have a slide which goes over some of the interim steps between how do we get from here to uh, to to a final one water plan, and, and we'll go over that. Um, I'll start off really quickly by just showing this overview slide of um, of, of the water cycle. Um, when council made the decision back in 2016 to look at its water infrastructure, and it, and it decided to to take that look in a, in a holistic way, uh, a way that a number of folks in the industry are currently approaching, looking at their water infrastructure, was which is to look at the combined water uh, wastewater collection and stormwater systems together, um, and that term is deemed. Uh, one water. So as you can see up here on the right hand side of this slide, the names of a number of different agencies that are undertaking similar plans and planning efforts as a city of Morro Bay, most notably uh, the city of Los Angeles that completed their one water plan earlier this year. Um, so the city is, is following suit with a number of folks uh, within California. 
just to interrupt briefly, uh, we'll be taking some pauses um, throughout this presentation in case we have any questions along the way. Great, thanks for that guidance. Thanks, Rob. So again, the goals of the One Water Plan, and the presentation is going to kind of follow the individual components of the One Water Plan uh, as we walk through it tonight. Um, the first thing is to really determine the necessary improvements and capital projects that the city needs to implement over the next 20 years uh, for its water distribution, wastewater collection, and stormwater systems. Um, the other portion of the One Water Plan looks at not just the infrastructure that's in the ground, but also the city's current water supply and improvements or um, modifications to its current water supply portfolio. Um, the third component is, is to inform the general plan and the local coastal plan update. And then um, at the end here, we have that it's informing the uh, WERF uh, rate study that was recently done this past summer. Um, and we'll get into a little bit of the interplay between the One Water Plan and the WERF uh, project as we move forward here. The goal of the meeting tonight really is to review what was done on the water, sewer, and stormwater sides of the house. And really, we're going to focus on the capital improvement program that was identified as a result of the identified deficiencies and the projects that we've identified. Um, we'll focus a little bit on some of the deficiencies that we identified in the stormwater system, since that's a new component that we're bringing to you tonight. You've heard about the water system and the collection system mainly because we fast-tracked those portions of the plan so that we could identify the projects and that could be included in the in the rate study process that was done earlier this year. Um, we'll focus a little bit on the water supply alternatives as one of the key components of the program, or of, excuse me, of the plan, uh, and then we'll present some of the results of that water supply evaluation. So as we move through here, as Rob mentioned, really going to talk in four um, four points here tonight. We'll fo first focus on the water master planning effort. At the end of the water master planner planning uh, component, we'll have a chance have a chance to ask ask questions. We'll then go through the collection system. You have, again, have the chance to ask questions, stormwater, and then the water supply evaluation component. So in terms of the water master plan, the, uh, this slide up here shows the breakdown of the activities that we went through in order to develop the, the water master plan component of the one water plan. It really started with a, a pretty big uh, data analysis task. We had a number of different items that we asked the, the city to provide. Um, we looked at historical and projected water demands to figure out one how much water does the city currently use and how much will it use in the future. We then uh, break into the modeling task, which is kind of the lion's share of the effort for, um, for these plans is the development of the hydraulic model. Um, and then we work with the city to develop the planning and design criteria that we use to identify what components of the city system are deficient or adequate, both for current conditions and for future conditions. We went through a lot of the planning and design criteria that was used previously in a previous presentation, but I can answer any questions that you have on those if I don't cover that here tonight. We then look and we determine first the deficiencies in the existing system, and then we look at the deficiencies in the future system when we apply those future demands. And then based on those deficiencies, we identify projects to correct those deficiencies and then determine the costs of those projects. We then end up with a CIP at the end of the day, which identifies a number of different projects and the cost for those projects. We go through a prioritization effort with staff, and uh, in this case, we went through a little bit of a different prioritization effort on the city, on the water and sewer side, because of the timing of the uh, of the rate study. And again, we'll go through that process. Then we end up with the one water plan report itself. So this screenshot here shows the uh, hydraulic model that was created for the city's water distribution system. And what we do is once we create the model, we subject the model to a number of different conditions. Um, in the case for the water distribution system, we look at the system during average day demand conditions. We look at it during peak hour demand conditions, which is essentially the worst case scenario that the system will see. Essentially during the hottest part of the year, um, during the, um, the, the hour of the year when the, when the demand is highest within the system, we look at how the system performs under that most stringent condition. And then we also look at uh, fire flow conditions 
condition, we apply a maximum day demand scenario to the system and overlay uh, fire flow requirements to determine if there's any deficiencies. Um, as you can see up here, this was a model run that shows the system under average day conditions. And as you would expect, uh, a number of the of the um, of the the dots or what we call nodes are, are green up there. The average day demand condition is is a fairly uh, is not a very stringent condition for the system. So as I mentioned, once we run the model under current and future conditions, we identify uh, deficiencies. And so I wanted to highlight a couple of the main deficiencies that we identified in the water distribution system. On the whole, not a lot of deficiencies that were identified for the water distribution system, but what we did identify are some shortage, uh, some storage shortfalls for a couple of the city's uh, main water zones. Um, one of those was the Elena tank. The recommendation for the Elena tank is to replace uh, those tanks with a, a, a larger 100 50,000 gallon tank. And then the other one that I'm sure um, council is familiar with is the nutmeg tank. So uh, we're recommending that that uh, existing tank be replaced with a much larger 1 million gallon tank up there at the nutmeg site. Um, in addition to the storage facilities, we also look, take a look at the city's pumping facilities and we um, use the criteria of um, is the pump station have enough capacity to operate where it needs to operate with one unit out of service, so with some level of redundancy. And what we identified is a couple of pump stations that had some uh, redundancy, or excuse me, some capacity deficiencies. Uh, one, the Vashon booster pump station, and the other one is the Elena booster pump station. However, uh, in working with staff, we identified a way to eliminate the Vashon booster pump station from the system by interconnecting a couple of zones. So by doing some piping improvements, we could eliminate the need for this pump station. Um, this pump station, we, uh, we spent a few days with, um, with Joe Miller and his staff uh, touring the various uh, water and sewer facilities throughout the city. And it became very clear the Vashon booster pump station is a, is a source of, of headache for his staff in terms of operation and maintenance. It's located in somebody's front yard. Um, it's in need of some significant repairs. So the fact that we were able to um, eliminate that pump station from the system is going to have some long-term, not only some, some, capital, um, some, some capital upside, but also so it's going to alleviate a lot of long-term O&M costs for the city. We also identified uh, some fire flow deficiencies throughout the city. And when I talk about fire flow deficiencies, um, essentially we um, subject the model to a certain demand condition each zone. Um, we look at the most stringent fire flow requirement. We run that fire flow and then we determine the pressures in the zone. And so what we're, what we're seeing here is in several of the zones, when we um, apply the fire flow requirement, we can meet the fire flow. But what we do is we drop pressures in the system below 25 PSI. The significance of that is we want to maintain a minimum pressure um, within the zone and we typically use 20 to 25 PSI so that we're not having uh, issues with water flowing back into the system which can be um, which can be an issue. So we did identify um, some pipes that were undersized in order to be able to serve fire flow and maintain that low pr that, that minimum pressure within the system. So based on all of that, the data analysis, looking at demands, we'll look at we'll talk a little bit about the demand analysis that was performed. We talk about the water supply evaluation component of the One Water Plan, um, but the end game here in a master planning document is the development of the CIP. So. For the water distribution system in May of this last year, we had a CIP that looks much like this, the one that's up on the screen. It's about a $26 million CIP, uh, and you'll see a breakdown of um, kind of the three different uh, time periods. We have a zero to five year period, so from now until about 2023. Uh, the second five year period from 2024 to 2028, and then we have a, uh, the, the last 10 year period from 2029 to 2040 and you'll see the breakdown of those. In a normal master planning effort, we would probably probably end there, and the city would adopt the master plan and have the CIP, um, that it would then take a look at the CIP when it went for any rate increases or looking at how it would plan future years. 
but the fact that we were in the middle of um, the rate study uh, presented us with a, a, a number of challenges, but a, a, one, a big opportunity to take a really hard look at the CIP uh, and, and prioritize it um, accordingly. So uh, as you all know, back in April, the city created the Blue Ribbon Commission, um, four members of the community that were tasked with participating in um, the rate setting process. Um, and this is just a copy of their report. One of the things that they did was they took a very hard look at the 20 year CIPs that we produced for both water and the collection system. And they challenged uh, Corolo, they challenged staff to try to reduce the size of that CIP in the initial phase, um, knowing that we have a large, uh, a large project coming up in the, in the WERF project. So um, up here is just their mission statement again. Uh, equitable and reasonable customer rates was the end goal of uh, really why the Blue Ribbon Commission was formed. So we have our idealized CIP that we came in with in May. And what we ended up with was what I would call an optimized and reprioritized CIP. So you'll see that the number at the very beginning, the CIP cost estimate, the 26 million doesn't change. So what the city's planning to spend over the next 20 years on its water, water infrastructure doesn't change. But what you'll see is the mix changes between that first time period, that first five years, the second five years, and the last 10 years. So what we had to do is prioritize the projects that were most critical to be done in the next five years in that, in that zero to five year bucket and push some of the other projects out in order to help keep rates as low as possible. So that was the water distribution side. Okay, so this is a good pause for questions. Great, great time for questions. Okay, great. Yeah. Turn to my left and red if you have questions at this point. We can just start from red and work to the right. I don't have any questions. Okay, Matt? John? Yeah. yeah, Eric, one question mm -hmm. on the, you just mentioned the, the capital improvement mm -hmm. program. Yes. Um, in the current uh, new rate structure, um, is the total of this capital improvement uh, dollars here included in the $41 proposed assessment for five unit average use? That's correct. Okay, and that, that goes out for a period until 2040? Correct. And what about since that rate continues beyond that, was that just averaged over that period of time to, to cover that assessment? Mm -hmm. That's Great. Correct. So in addition to the capital improvements for the uh, plant itself, mm -hmm. the new lift station and the uh, piping associated with the plant, et cetera, um, this uh, rate increase that uh, will occur includes all of the dollars, which I'm looking at, um, a total of uh, what? The bottom line 26? here, 20, 26 in the first. Um, well, 26, 26 million through 24. Oh, total yeah. over that period yeah. of time. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks, John. Marlis. Yeah, uh, let me just ask a question, mm -hmm. if this is the right time to do it, about uh, the assumptions that you made about cons our water consumption. Mm -hmm. Would this be the time to ask that question? Yeah. Um, I, actually, if we could hold off on that one until we get to the water supply evaluation, I have a graph that'll help kind of oh, depict okay, the way yeah. that we came up with the future demands. Yeah. Okay. So, that's fine. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll wait then. We'll get there. <laughs> All right. All right. And if I don't, I know we, we definitely will. There's a slide in there. All right. Thanks, Marlis. Um, uh, Eric, thanks very much, um, and thanks for meeting with uh, me earlier today. And specifically, I had some questions on the CIP. And so, um, as we talk about the CIP that we have on the screen and how it's explained and, and great that Councilmember Heading uh, uh, posed the question as well on our rate structure that's paying for the CIP that we have before us. Mm -hmm. uh, can you elaborate a little bit more? Um, one of my questions earlier today was fundamentally on the CIP program and how we in the past have gone through um, a water facility master plan, a wastewater, and it's, it's in this report mm -hmm. and it dates those specific plans. And can you just summarize the advent, the advantage that we're in right now since we have actually passed the rates to accomplish this versus the previous plans and how that compares? Yeah, so um, again, those plans date back. Um, I believe the most recent plan was from 2007, which was the collection system master plan. Um, the water master plan dates back to 1996-97, um, so almost 20 years. One of the benefits that this plan has over those previous master plans, well, there's two main benefits. Um, one would be the 
um, really the focus on a, um, a, a well thought out and prioritized CIP. So those previous plans, while they identified some deficiencies within the system, they identified some money that would be needed to um, correct some of those deficiencies, it didn't necessarily go through the rigor of, of identifying a, a robust CIP really tied to different years. So even within the details of the CIP here, we've taken an individual project. Um, an example from one that's included in the zero to five year time period would be the Nutmeg Tank Project. And we've even broken it down between different program, different phases of the project and how that money would be spent over different years. Um, so in the detailed CIP in the report, you can, you can see how that's done. So I think that's one of the advantages of, of really the goal of this whole effort really is to develop a CIP where those previous plans didn't necessarily walk away with a, a real structured CIP. Um, the other one is that um, this was really done within um, within the discussion of a, of a rate of a rate study and looking at ways to fund these. So that was the other piece that was um, that's that's interesting is that you know we can do um, master planning documents all day long and develop CIPs and as I mentioned we can develop kind of the our the pie in the sky CIP where budget's not an issue and here's what we our wish list and here's what we want to do. Very rarely do we have the benefit of actually taking that through the rate process and coming out with something that not only do have we identified the priority and the needs for these different projects, but we've also identified the funding for these different projects. Great, thanks. Can I Just ask a follow-up question. Sure, Mom. All right. Um, were any of these projects included in the 2015 uh, rate increase? Any of these capital improvement projects that we're planning now? <coughs> in this five-year period? Uh, yes, there were some. I think the one that I can speak to that I, I can know off the top of my head was the Nutmeg Tank. That was a project that was um, that was envisioned back when the 2015 rate increase was done. Um, uh, the decision was made to do the additional analysis and planning work to, to further refine what that project looked like before moving it forward to them. Okay, thanks. Just want to add that in previous budgets, um, we used carry a line item that said miscellaneous water system improvements really never identified what those were because previous master plans um, weren't explicit in their um, as Mr. Casera said in their development of the annual CIP as this one is and you will also notice in our um, last couple of years budgets we've made vast improvements on our CIP section, um, starting with Mr. Smullinger and continuing forward, um, we actually can, and the public can determine what CIPs are actually approved and which ones are not approved due to budget constraints. So we have a very clear path to what we're doing um, in any budget year. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks Eric, thank, thank you. you. Okay. So now we'll move on to the collection system master plan um, component. Um, again, this slide looks a little pretty familiar. It's not a terribly different process that we go through on the collection system side as we do on the water system side. Um, don't tell my modeling folks that I said that, though. It, it's pretty different. <laughs> um, but we again, a very robust data analysis where we, we're getting a lot of information from the city um, and, and creating the city's collection system uh, in, in the modeling software. Again, much like the water demand side, we also look at the wastewater generation factors and we come up with what are the flow that we're going to see uh, in the collection system, um, both what are we seeing now and then what does that project to in the future up to 2040. Again, um, as we use things like velocity and pressure in the water distribution system, it's a little bit different for the collection system. We use things like depth of flow in the pipe uh, and, and, uh, and the capacity of lift stations um, as our metrics for determining if something is quote unquote deficient or not deficient. Um, again, then we, we identify those deficiencies, we identify projects, develop a CIP, and then put together the report. Again, not, not so different than the, the water distribution modeling effort. Up here is a screenshot of the model, the city's existing wastewater collection system model. Oh. 
one of the unique aspects of the collection system model is not only are we looking at, at um, wastewater generation as a means um, of, of sizing the infrastructure, looking at the adequacy of the pipes, but um, inflow and infiltration is something that, that nearly all collection systems are subject to. And so for that reason, we um, subject the collection system to a design storm. Uh, in, in this case, I believe it's a 10-year, 24-hour storm. I have to get back to you on that. I don't. Ah, it is a 10-year, 24-hour storm. Um, and so we apply that 10-year, 24-hour storm over the system to identify where what the peak flows look like uh, in the future. Um, the deficiencies on the collection system uh, were not very widespread. Um, they were centered along the Main Street line. Um, there were some very, very minor deficiencies with um, the, the pumping capacity of one of the city's lift stations, um, something that's not very concerning and could actually be uh, probably that imp those improvements could be avoided if the, some other work was done in, the, in that area of the collection system, reduce I&I. &I. So again, not a high priority. Um, but what we did see is, that again, the deficiencies associated with the Main Street line. In addition to those deficiencies in the Main Street line, there were a number of other projects that we included into the CIP to cover some miscellaneous items. Um, one of those was rehabilitation in the area west of Highway 1. Um, coming into this study, city staff had indicated that was the area of highest INI, and we went through and the flow monitoring study was done and we did our analysis, and that proved to be um, to be to be correct. The highest areas of INI are there west of Highway 1. And so we've included... Oh. Excuse me for the audience. Can you just explain INI? Excuse me. Uh, so inflow and infiltration. So during, during wet weather storm event, um, you have direct connections to the collection system and that's your inflow component. So rainwater is going directly into the sewer lines, either through a manhole lid or a direct connection of a storm of a storm sewer to the uh, to the collection system. And then inflow is when you get high groundwater as a result of a rainflow event. Water seeps into the into the um, into cracks or um, separated joints in the pipe. Um, so we included some amount of money for continued re rehabilitation of the area west of Highway 1, so replacement of, of um, leaking pipes and manholes and, and those items. Um, we also recommend a five-year update to the master plans. So um, every five years, the city would pick up the master plan, do another flow study, relook at the model, input the projects that have been completed over the previous five years, and then look how that influences the, the next 15 years. So you're always kind of working in these five-year increments and pushing out five years. Uh, in a perfect world, I'll say. Um, we have some general pipeline replacement work um, that the city will be doing just to replace aging infrastructure. Again, periodic flow monitoring is something that goes hand-in-hand -hand with that periodic update to the master plan, and then manhole replacements uh, citywide as well. Much like the water distribution um, master planning effort. We developed an idealized CIP. This one's a little bit smaller, about 18.2 million. Um, and we, this was developed back in May, and we came to the Blue Room Commission and sat down, and we started to look at ways to prioritize and modify the CIP to reduce costs. Um, so again, the an overall cost in the 20-year CIP is not different. It's the mix between the different five-year increments, or first five years, second five years, and last 10 years. And again, um, the major priority that was identified for the first five years for the collection system was f the fixing the Main Street line uh, north of Atascadero Road. Any questions? Okay, we'll start off with Marlis this time on questions. Uh, I'm going to get back again to um, the timing of these improvements and any possible future rate increases. Does this take into account the current uh, rate structure that we have uh, um, adopted? Uh, and does it imply that in five years we're going to need another 218? Or can you... No, this CIP here is what was included in the yep. uh, in the rate study. In the rate study. Correct. So at this point, we're not projecting any additional rate increases. That's correct. OK, thank you. Thanks, Marlis. John? Uh, yeah, thank you, Eric, again, for the information. Uh, one question would be, since we um, have set an annual review of rates um, that is capped on the upside but can be reduced based upon various um, variables, if this CIP program um, 
which is going to be reviewed every five years, did I hear you say, um, yeah. or annually? Yeah, so um, I, I guess if we're talking about two things. So the city is talking about an annual rate review policy right. where they would be able to look at this, the CIP and how what was planned to be spent the previous year versus what's going to be spent. So that would be looked at, I, I understand it, on an annual basis. The CIP itself would kind of be completely re-racked every five years, and that would be um, it's really the three things together. It would be the you do the flow monitoring study, you do the master plan update, and as a result of that master plan update, you have a, a revised CIP. Thank you. And, and, and I guess the bottom line question is this. Um, if, if during that five-year window when you looked at, or at the five-year period when you reevaluated capital improvements, if a number were not necessary, and thusly um, the capital outlay um, would not be necessary, then there would be a possibility during the annual, annual review that the rates could be adjusted down based upon that. However, if there were new determinations that there were further increased capital needs, that could not occur without a, another 218 vote. Am I correct in assuming that? That's correct. It, the, the city could look at, um, one good example would be, um, you know, let's, let's say three years down the road, um, the city's completed the planning work, the design work, and they've bid the nutmeg tank project, and they're carrying a certain budget in the CIP for the construction cost of, of, of that tank. Um, if bids come in and bids are lower than um, than what was identified in the CIP for that nutmeg tank project, significantly lower, um, then the city could, in going into the next annual rate review, say, okay, well, we assume the tank was going to cost X and it now costs Y. Um, that has this impact on the rates, which means that we don't have to implement the, the maximum rate this year. That would be one example of, of how that process could be used. Um, or the city could look at it and say, okay, that will, and we could keep the rates where they were going to be and we could pull up some additional um, capital work that we knew we know we were going to need to do a couple years down the road. And so there's there's the, it gives the, the city council that option to make those decisions at that time. Thank you so much. Okay, Matt. Um, that leads a um, very good question, John, because this leads to, um, Eric, in terms of the opposite of that, if we find out with the CIP going forward for the nutmeg project, if the cost is higher, in terms of this one master, one water master plan, would could we then, or what would be the process of adjusting the um, monies that have been put, set aside to uh, that we would have to pay for that project? Would we just cut out other parts of the project? Yeah, th that's that's likely. Um, yeah, what this what the city w would have to do is, you know, I, I said that you know they're, they're really we're anchoring the water CIP in the nutmeg project and some other smaller projects, and then the w the collection system side in the in the improvements to the main street line. There are some other smaller ancillary projects and some things that could potentially be um, be pushed out if things like, if, if cost increases arose for the tank project per, per se you could you could take say okay well we're going to move forward with the tank project we're not going to hold off on that but that means on on the water on the waste on the collection system side we may have to avoid doing as many manhole replacements as we had planned or something like that thanks red when are we planning to uh, install the nutmeg tank um, the current CIP has that project starting essentially this fiscal year um, with the initial planning and design phase. Um, I believe it's the project spread over about four years. Um, there's some, some pretty significant work that will need to be done in the planning and design, specifically in the, in the environmental. The city has made some progress on, on that project, but it's changed and morphed over the years, um, and, and the environmental work is probably going to be the item on the critical path for that project. Thank you. Additionally, on the nutmeg tank, it is outside the city limits, and we will be working with the county to permit that uh, project. Thanks. Um, thanks, Eric. The, the five-year periodic plan update, is, is that um, structured within as part of the CIP planning? That's correct. So in other words, when I look at that, it says, okay, in five years, we budgeted in our rate study that we're going to be doing this periodic update. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. They're one of those things that um, uh, the, the more often that you revisit and update them, um, the, the, over the long run, they're less costly to do yep. them in that way. If you wait years and years, technology value, changes. Time value money on yeah. that. Thank you. Um, that's all I have. Thanks. Great. 
Okay, we'll move through the um, stormwater portion next. It should be pretty straight. Uh, this should be pretty straightforward. Um, of all the CIPs, I'll just give you guys a, a, a quick a quick hint. Um, it's the smallest CIP of the three CIPs that were developed for the water, sewer, and, and storm systems. Um, one, this, because the city does not have as much stormwater infrastructure uh, as, as it has water and, and sewer infrastructure, obviously. Um, Again, we go through a fairly similar uh, process where we look at, uh, we have, a, a, again, a big data ask and do a lot of data analysis. Um, we develop a hydrologic and hydraulic model, a little bit of a different model. Um, again, we develop this planning and design criteria that essentially says, um, when looking at different elements of the system, how do we say if that element of the system is either um, gets a, a thumbs up and it's okay, or it, we identify it as something that needs to, it's deficient and, and it needs attention. Um, again, we did the evaluation of the stormwater system, identified the improvements, came up with the costs, and came up with the CIP. Here is a uh, model screenshot of the city's uh, existing stormwater system. Um, the city stormwater system mostly consists of uh, some piping, a lot of uh, a lot of overland flow. Um, like the collection system, we um, submit the stormwater uh, model to a couple of different design storms. Uh, in this case, we use a 10-year, 24-hour storm, um, and we have one set of criteria that determines if the system is deficient under this 10-year, 24-hour um, storm event, and then we also have a 100-year storm event. The difference between uh, these two is that we, when we overlay and apply the 10-year storm, we say, okay, well, if something's not, we, we can tolerate a certain amount of flooding um, before we deem that something is deficient uh, and that criteria gets raised with a hundred year um, with a hundred year storm um, we've identified some flooding throughout the system for the 10-year design storm event um, and one thing I should have mentioned when we were talking about the water distribution and the, and the collection system um, improvements as well and this is something you'll see in the final um, the final one water plan is in in chapter one um, we had a number of check-ins throughout the pro we had a number of meetings with the city staff throughout this process but three um, pointed meetings one on the water system one on the collection system and one on the stormwater system um, you know the, the model the, the models that we develop we need to have some um, reliance that they're accurate and we have a number of tools that we use to determine if those are accurate but at the end of the day it's important to make sure that what we're seeing in the model matches what staff sees every day when they're out there um, operating maintaining the system so um, one example here is for the stormwater system we identified areas of flooding we sat down with um, with miss Hansen and Joe and his crew uh, and I and looked and said okay well we identify during this type of storm event that we're getting flooding in this area can you guys confirm that and we went through that exercise uh, on the stormwater system as well as on the water system where we said hey we see some issues in this location some areas of low pressure and they would say yes or no and then we would go into the model and, and figure out why we have the discrepancy there between what the model is showing and what real life is showing so just wanted to, to, to throw that in there again we see some additional flooding when we uh, apply the hundred year storm event so based on the 100-year and 10-year storm events, again, we developed a CIP. Um, the details of the CIP are an, included in the report. Um, about 75% of the cost of the CIP of the roughly $11 million CIP is wrapped up in deficiencies that are created from the 10-year storm event. Um, the improvements mostly consist of uh, upsizing or installation of, of new storm drain piping. That's the, the majority of the infrastructure improvements. Um, the city doesn't have a lot of uh, a lot of space for stormwater retention basins and those kinds of things, and so most of the improvements that we're making are what we call gray infrastructure improvements, so piping. Questions? Questions for Eric, Marlis, <coughs> John, Matt, Red. I want to try to <clears throat> understand how the stormwater works. Uh, is the the design that most of the stormwater will be collected and flow directly to the sea? Correct. And there will be some elements of infiltration, and there will be some inflow as well, and those will go through the uh, the wharf. 
for or the water treatment plant. Uh, right? It does take into account the flows that would make it into the collection system. So it, that that is that is partially taken into account, and then we also use the different soil. We we use uh, impervious areas within the city. We identify those, and then for the pervious areas, we have different soil types that we overlay with those impervious areas to figure out what the infiltration would be. So how much is going in to the ground versus how much is going into the collection system, the wastewater collection system versus how much is is going out to the ocean. Okay, um, but the effect is that some part of the stormwater is captured by the city and goes through the water treatment plant. Correct. Okay, thanks. All right, thanks. Eric, um, so you said the majority of the uh, CIP costs um, or planning is for storm drain piping. Mm -hmm. And what about culverts and, and surface mounted yep. drainage and things like that? There's, yeah, catch I mean, there, basins, there's quite a bit of that as well. Catch basins, culverts. Catch basins, culverts. Yeah, culverts, piping. Yeah. Okay. And then um, Red, uh, Red, you had a comment on that that triggered a question. I'll have to come back to it because I didn't, I didn't quite get it down. So I'm sure I'll think of it in a minute. Okay. But the culverts was one. All right. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, that's by piping. I mean, you know, kind of underground improvements, those kinds of things. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So we're now we're going to switch gears a little bit to the final component, which is the water supply evaluation. This is the component that's, um, I guess, less like the others, um, where we're looking at the uh, the infrastructure modeling is the main heart of the other master plans. We're really taking a higher level look at the city's water supply picture, and um, in in either. Um, diversifying or adding to that water supply portfolio. So um, what we first did with the uh, the water supply evaluation, and this was done in tandem with the water master planning effort, was um, to look at the, the current and future demands. Um, and again, this is going back to, to Council Member McPherson's previous, previous question. We're going to get into that. We looked at alternatives. So what are the different ways that the city of Morro Bay could diversify and add to its existing water supply portfolio? We developed a number of different evaluation criteria that we used to screen those alternatives. That was a combination of what we call qualitative criteria as well as economic criteria. Um, we evaluated each alternative. Um, we developed cost estimates. Not only did we look at capital costs, but we also looked at 20-year um, at net present value or a total life cycle cost for different alternatives. Um, in, in every case, no single water supply alternative provided enough water to, to meet all of the city's needs. So what we had to do is we had to combine different water supply alternatives to come up with these water supply suites that essentially would be, in any given year, this is what the city's water supply, this is what the makeup could look like, some portion of state water, or some portion of groundwater, or some portion of desal. And so we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. And then we came up with the water master, or the water, um, one water plan report. Um, this is just a summary of where the city's water has come from um, over the uh, over the last roughly 20 years. Um, 1997 uh, is when the uh, the state state water uh, started for the city, and from then on, state water is made up the majority of the city's water supply. Uh, it's augmented um, yearly with either water from. Uh, the Choro Valley, most recently um, water from, from the Morro Valley that goes through the city's Brackish Water RO system uh, and then goes to the King's Tank. So this goes to the, um, the the projection of water demands. And so this has been something that we've been dealing with. And it's been a little bit tricky over the last couple of years um, as we've been doing a number of these master plans. One, because the historical water demand has been so low. So with the, the mandated um, aggressive conservation goals that have been put in place in 2015 and 2016, under a, a normal master planning effort, we would come to the city. In this case, we started in 2017. And we would ask the city for the last five years, five complete years years of, of water um, water supply information and we would use that to come up with the total water demand for the city and then we divide that by the population in each of those given years to come up with a water demand per person and that's used as a proxy for um, the total commercial residential uh, industrial the total water demand for the city and then we use uh, population and population increases that we can then tie to the general plan as a way to come up with the with the projections. So um, t as I mentioned, 2015 and 2016 um, were very problematic. As you can see up here in the top right hand corner, it's a little hard to see. But towards the bottom, the city had a had a historic low of about 87 gallons per capita day. 
of, of water demand. And as you can see, um, kind of the 10-year the baseline um, that's up there it was up at about 118 gallons per capita day. And so um, in a number of these master plans, as I mentioned, we don't want to use 2015 and 2016 because we know that water demand is going to rebound. So um, we're not going to see conservation at the levels without them being mandated at the levels that we saw in 2015 and 2016. Um, existing or, or recent water supply and demand information has shown that demand has increased since the drought has been has been over and so we've got to pick a number somewhere um, somewhere kind of in the middle of these two numbers in order to to we don't want to we don't want to hedge our bets and go too high and over project what the city's water demands are going to be we also don't want to be too low and so what we've been using for a number of our plans is an average of the demands from about 2010 to 2014 and that's what we used here um, here for the city which gives us to a, a water demand of about 106 gallons per capita day. And then you can see um, on the bottom, the graph on the bottom shows the projections out from 2018 on to 2040. So using that, that, that factor, um, we come up with an ultimate water demand of about 1,400 acre feet in the year 2040. One of the things that we started off the water supply evaluation with was a pretty robust look at state water and the long-term cost of state water. Um, the reason being uh, there's a lot of talk uh, in the state about the California water fix, which is about a 17 uh, to a $19 billion project that has been uh, discussed in order to improve the state water project. Um, and we wanted to look at what the impacts of that was going to be on the long-term cost of state water. There's a couple of interesting things to note on this graph here. One is we see a pretty high unit cost for state water back in 2015 um, because the, the city did not receive its, uh, all of its allocation. But in the future, we're going to see some drops in the cost of state water in the, in the very immediate future with um, some bonds that are going to be retired um, for, uh, for the Central Coast region, and then some additional debt that's going to be retired by DWR for the whole of state water project. So um, the, the takeaway message here is when you combine these reductions in the cost of state water um, with the anticipated costs impacts of the California water fix, the long-term cost of state water for the city should stay relatively constant. It's going to slightly increase. As you can see, there's an upward trend here between years. The, the annual O&M cost for state water goes up by a few percent. Um, and so, but on the, on, on the whole, the long-term cost of state water should stay relatively constant. So that was our look at state water, and so that's kind of our benchmark that we used to take a look at some different alternatives. And we took a look at, there's six alternatives, but it's really um, more than 10 with the sub-alternatives that we looked at. And you can group them into some different groups. One is state water or the imported water. One is um, use of the city's existing groundwater supply. Um, one is uh, taking water, treated water from a new wastewater treatment plant, putting it into Choro Creek to be able to meet uh, minimum stream flow and take full advantage of the city's groundwater permit for Choro. The other one is the, um, the injection of uh, highly purified water into the Moore Well field, i.e. Um, IPR or indirect potable reuse, which is the project the city is currently moving forward with on the, on the wharf side. A couple different iterations of that. Uh, and then ocean desalination and direct potable reuse. So as I mentioned, again, none of these options on their own will meet the city's full water demand in the year 2040. And so what we had to do is, is combine different water supply alternatives together to come up with something that would meet the full demand in the future. And this graph up here shows what the makeup of these different alternatives would be. So one example would be um, alternative 4A, which would be the use of IPR. Under, the, under IPR, um, the city will get to a point eventually where um, the the existing state water allocation can't meet the full demand, so um, IPR would make up the difference of that in, in this scenario. Another uh, alternative is uh, alternative five, which is uh, desalination, and you can see that based on the city's existing desal permit, it can't f it can't meet the full demand, and so you'd have to supplement that with a different water source. In this case, we've assumed state water for that alternative. So um, this is a summary of the cost information uh, in terms of dollars um, per acre foot. 
and um, a measure of drought resiliency. Um, one of the guiding principles that we used with the development of this water supply evaluation, um, obviously cost is very important. Um, cost per acre foot is the way that we typically look at different water supply options. But we also looked at drought resiliency and how resilient each of these supply sources is in terms of drought. So this table shows um, these different alternatives ranked in terms of their resiliency to drought. Um, and then the cost is in the, the second to left hand column cost per acre foot. This is just a summary of the key findings, um, kind of a high level look at the different groups of water supply options that we looked at. Um, so we'll look at state water. Again, state water as is, uh, it gets a plus here because it's the, the lowest cost, one of the lowest cost options that the city has in terms of a water supply. Um, doesn't really have any permitting challenges, obviously, um, but it provides no local supply offset for the city and, and really is at risk in terms of resiliency when you take a look at drought or other catastrophic issues like earthquakes um, when you look at that infrastructure. Um, groundwater, again, pretty low unit cost. There's a high local supply offset, um, but permitting can be a challenge because of the type of water right that the city holds. And resiliency can also be a challenge because the city's permit, um, at least for the, the Choro, um, for the Choro Valley is dependent on meeting minimum stream flows in Choro, which is problematic during, uh, during pe periods of drought. Stream flow augmentation was something that, frankly, coming into this, we were very interested in and thought that would be a good option for the city. However, in looking at it, there's some real permitting challenges um, for, for putting water, treated wastewater, into, into Choro Creek. Um, and so that was something that, um, that, was a, that was a big negative for that alternative. Um, it did show some promise in terms of a little bit lower unit costs than some of the other alternatives, but again, a big permitting challenge. Indirect potable reuse has a big, uh, is big in terms of resiliency and with local supply offset. Um, permitting challenges, there's a lot of permitting that goes along with potable reuse, but it's a very understandable and it's something that's been done uh, and is being done quite a bit here in the state, so it's positive there. Uh, unit cost is a little bit higher than some of the other alternatives. Um, desal is similar. We have some permitting challenges challenges there with long-term use or regular use of desal. And then direct potable reuse is something that we looked at. Again, permitting challenge for direct potable reuse is there really are no regulations that have been finalized for direct potable reuse at this time. And we're really guessing uh, at what those regulations are going to look like. So the recommendation that we have coming out of uh, the One Water Plan is that the city move forward with an indirect potable reuse project uh, at the water reclamation facility uh, as a way to augment its current water supply of, of, with state water. Again, um, immediately move forward with the additional hydrogeo work. There's the reason why we looked at several different sub alternatives for IPR in the in the report was because we did not know exactly what was going on in the groundwater as it relates to um, some of the contaminants that are there and how, how IPR will affect that. Um, we also recommend that when state water is available, even when the city has implemented an IPR project, that it use state water to its, to its fullest extent as it's available, um, with IPR as the backup to, since the city is locked in in the short term to, to state water. Um, and then, again, focus on using the injected water that's going to go into the Morrow well field to, to flush out the nitrate contamination in that well field. Again, state water is the lowest cost supply, should be maximized in the short term. Again, most of the cost that the city pays for state water is bound up in the fixed cost. So whether the city takes a drop of water or not, it's paying the lion's share of the cost of state water. So if it's available, it should be used. Um, the drought buffer could be discontinued, so that would be a potential cost savings for the city since your IPR um, source is now your quote unquote drought buffer or your secondary supply. Uh, and then really continue to monitor DWR's exchange policies. This is something that's exciting. Um, there's a lot of talk about DWR changing their policies in terms of uh, exchange. So the city may have the option to, um, to ex exchange uh, its, its allocation in the future. Um, ocean desal is a little tricky. Um, one of the recommendations here that we're making is to kind of de-energize the, 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 the wells, the seawater wells that are out there, but not to remove those wells in order to retain those well permits. Uh, in case something changes in the future, not remove the infrastructure, but not to, to no longer uh, maintain that infrastructure, but keep it, keep it as part of the city's option in the future. 
And then in terms of Choro groundwater, the city um, expends a decent amount of money every year in maintaining that well field. Um, really, as you look at all the water supply options, it really ranked, ranked the lowest um, in, in terms of our analysis. And so our recommendation would be to kind of discontinue the existing activities um, that the city is doing in order to maintain that well field. Um, quickly, we'll go through next steps, and then we can uh, I can answer any questions on the water supply evaluation. As I mentioned, um, we will we will very shortly here have a final uh, a final draft of the one water plan that includes every chapter. Um, that's going to go to PWAB on October seventeenth, um, with the plan to come back to City Council um, on November sixteenth. With excuse me, yes, November sixteenth with um, with the final one water plan. All right, great, Eric, thanks very much. And we'll start off with uh, final questions and then uh, get into discussion and remarks and comments. Um, Red, would you like to start us off on questions for this segment? Sure, thank you. Um, Eric, could you talk a little bit about the exchange policies and tell us what that means? Sure. At least tell me. I, perhaps I'm the only one who doesn't know. Sure. So right now, the DWR doesn't really have a mechanism for um, for the subcontractors in in the county or that are subcontractors to the county to exchange their water. So, um, for example, if Morro Bay wanted to take its full the total allocation for Morro Bay is 1,313 acre feet per year. The current demand right now is roughly about a thousand acre feet per year. Um, the city could take all of that 1,300 acre feet, um, but it really has no mechanism to exchange that with anybody and get and get any money for it. The only mechanism the city currently has is DWR has what they call the turn back pool, and um, that water that the city's paying roughly 1,300 to 1,500 acre feet to purchase could put it into the turn back pool where it gets something on the order of forty dollars an acre foot or. Uh, Twelve dollars an acre. Twelve dollars an acre foot. Unless it doesn't sell, and then it cost is reduced to six dollars an acre foot, and MWD buys it all. So there, there has been a, a, people are recognizing that there's others um, within the county, other agencies uh, within the county that are looking for um, alternative water supplies, and so um, hopefully the. DWR will change their exchange policies that would open it up to to be able to for the city to be able to exchange that capacity with someone so could I use the word sell instead of exchange sure that's okay. <laughs> exchange it for money or so yeah <laughs> yes sir I have a question for you on from 23 talking about ocean desalinization in terms of turning off the desal project and Will the, going forward, um, if we just take and we don't use um, desal water, but we, will we have enough water when state water is turned off for the month that we will be using from our new WRF going forward? That's a great question. So when we talk about, um, it's important to note, when we talk about desalination, we're talking about, there's two different um, sides of the de desal house that the city has um, down there at the corp yard. One side is what we call the brackish water RO facility, and that's what we run the water from through the Mora well field, um, and we treat that and it goes into the system. That, that system runs periodically throughout the year, definitely runs every year number one when state water can't meet the instantaneous demand uh, that Joe needs to meet for the system and then whenever, whenever um, state water is out so we're not talking about doing anything to that it's the ocean ocean desal or the seawater desal side that we're talking about the city has a separate um, RO system there that they use for ocean desal and then another set of seawater extraction wells um, and so what we're recommending is to de-energize the, the ocean desal wells kind of keep the existing uh, RO facility in place and just mothball it. It's been mothballed for, for a long time uh, and, and that way they can keep those well permits in place if something were to change in the future. But no immediate need to use that facility and actually one of the one of the things that I didn't talk about we talked about our previous presentations we did a pretty robust evaluation of the city's existing ocean water desal facility and um, that facility would need some very significant improvements if, if that was going to be used so if the city needed it right now it couldn't flip a switch and turn on that ocean desal side it, it would not operate Thank you. all right John 
Good. Thanks again, Eric. Um, first question is with regard to the, the total um, capital improvement projects that you've just outlined for the city and the, the overall cost over period to 2040, um, are the dollars built into the rate study eligible for SRF and EPA low interest funding or is it just the project itself? Um, <clears throat> the, the projects, um, Yes and no. So the, the WERF project, so the conveyance facilities, the improvements to the, the on-site improvements at South Bay Boulevard, um, the infrastructure to get the water uh, and, and inject it into um, uh, the lower Morro Basin, that is all eligible for EPA, WIFIA funding, and for the Clean Water SRF program. So on the water side, um, SRF has a has their drinking water SRF program, and potentially projects like the Nutmeg Tank could be co could be covered under the drinking water SRF program. Um, the projects that are identified on the collection system side would. Those would not be projects that the city would go after uh, SRF funds for. There's some other um, low interest uh, funding opportunities that may uh, that may be more appropriate for those types and, and size of projects, but but not SRF. I, I was just trying to recall: was the assumption in the rate study that the CIPs would be funded based upon a bond rate? That's correct. Yeah. So um, the makeup of the the, the financing for um, everything that was included in the rate study was was WIFIA to the tune of 49% of the project, a mixture of existing cash on hand and future cash um, that the city would put into the project, a planning loan um, from SRF that they've already secured, and then the remainder would be would be bonds. But, but there are. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Let me just clarify that a bit. So that's for the WERF project or WERF program for the the lift station injection wells, of course, main. The capital projects that we're talking about for the collection system and water system are, are proposed to be cash funded, cash funded. Um, through uh, revenue. Yeah. So that was my next question. Um, is there sufficient cash on hand to fund that without uh, incurring debt service costs? And is that based into the assumption? Um, there Over the life of the projects to 2040. Over the life of the projects, they've built in a schedule that there would be existing cash coming in. We don't have it today, but we would accumulate it over the course of the projects. Based upon the existing rates um, that were approved. That's correct in the schedule that Eric and um, right. Rob and Joe have scheduled out. I think that, yeah, well, I'll, I'll comment about that in a minute. I won't, that's the question. Um, the second question is, uh, for state water supply, um, if you take it, do you have to use it, or can you store it if you take your full allocation and don't need it? Um, you can take it and store it in San Luis Reservoir, and, and Rob can talk to that a little bit more. It's a bit of a nuanced situation where you, you can store it until um, a spilling event occurs, uh, and then the city would lose what it has stored behind, uh, behind in San Luis. So. That's exactly right. Um, a lot of the um, Southern California communities have their own local um, storage reservoirs like MWD has Piru, um, Santa Barbara County has Kachuma that they store their excess allocation in. We have no local um, reservoir here on the coast to store that water in um, that's available to connect to. Um, this water stored in San Luis Reservoir is where um, when we ask for 900 acre feet a year, that 400 acre feet a year goes in. We l kind of floated off that balance during the drought years, but last year San Luis Reservoir spilt. It didn't actually physically spill, it spilled on paper because they could fulfill all of the requests for water. Um, and everybody's stored water resets to zero. Um, it resets to zero. Okay. Yes. Got it. Thanks. That, that explains that. Um, your page 19. Um, from 2017, your top graph to 2040, um, the demand only increases 13.3%. Seems low. I'm just asking. Um, I see what it's based on and, and the needs, but um, going from 1275 um, to demand to 1445 is, is just a 13.3% increase. I guess that's based upon the limited population uh, growth of the city that's capped through the initiative. And yeah, I believe that's correct, yeah. Yes. 
I have to take a look at that a little bit more. I'm trying to think. You're talking about historical, the historical demand numbers being? We, you're page 19. Uh, if you want to look at your graph, it, it says in 2017 the demand is 1275. Our future demand out in 2040 will be 1445. That's a 13.3% increase. Okay. It seemed low. Um, it's a function of the population. The population, population growth and the limit that has been set. That's correct. And it doesn't anticipate any major new growth initiatives for the city. No, this is all based on the uh, on the land use the land use information that was that's in the city's existing general plan or the current general plan the city's working on. Yeah, Great. so it's all based off the general plan. Great, thank you very much. My last question is, DPR, any further information on how far out that might be? Any inklings? And my, my, my assumption would be possibly, and this is a question, that larger cities, if it did come to fruition, would realize the possibility of utilizing it before smaller cities like Morro Bay? There's a couple of interesting things to note. So the city, or the, excuse me, the state has committed to developing the DPR regulations by 2023, and, and all signs point to those those being in place by 2023. Um, earlier this year, the city, or excuse me, the state came out with um, with its uh, initial plan. I think it was in June or July, June of this year. Um, a couple of interesting takeaways from that, and and what we've gleaned from that document is one. Um, the state is going to be more likely to permit a DPR facility for a larger, um, a larger agency, um, a very, I'm trying to think of the best way to put this, but a very sophisticated agency. Um, they've also indicated that they would be more likely to permit a DPR facility for some, for an agency that's already operating an IPR facility. So if you've shown that you can meet the rigorous monitoring and reporting requirements associated with IPR, then likely you could move towards DPR if you wanted to do that. So the bottom line is the possibility of Morro Bay being able to utilize DPR um, technology once it's approved would be much farther out than just the date of approval that the state makes of the, the regs. In, in my yeah, in my opinion, that would be that would be the case. I think um, the most likely path that Morro Bay would have to DPR would be the implementation uh, and demonstration that they could operate a successfully operate an IPR pro process first. Thank you. Thanks, Marlos. Okay, I'm going to follow up on that question with. Um, what would it take to go from an uh, indirect potable reuse to a direct potable reuse? Would it you be using, obviously the uh, treatment facility would mm -hmm. remain the same, but you would need to make other changes? Would, it, would you still be using uh, part of the, uh, what we've invested in the indirect potable reuse? Uh, that's, that's correct. So at, at this point, it's, uh, it's a bit of conjecture. Um, a number of or, uh, folks that, uh, that work for, um, that for Corolla are involved in the development of those regulations. Um, so we've got a little bit of insight on what that might look like. Again, um, wouldn't be any uh, wasting of the current infrastructure that's planned for IPR. Um, there could be some intermediate treatment steps that would need to, to slot into that process. Um, but the, the, the most likely path would be um, would be something like uh, some addition, so conversion of an IPR project to a DPR project for Morro Bay would likely look like the inclusion of additional treatment processes um, to the IPR, IPR project, uh, discharge of that water into a reservoir, some type of, of um, storage buffer. That's what the state is big on. Um, storage buffer and and, uh, and and time, which is a lot of what goes into the IPR, putting the water in the ground and having that minimum travel time. It's all about reaction time. So that water would have additional treatment steps in the treatment plan. It would go into a reservoir likely, and then it would have to go through a water treatment plan um, before it could go into the, into the distribution system. There may be other mechanisms, um, but right now that's looking like what's going to be that's what's going to be permitted in 2023 or that the regulations for that type of potable reuse or what's going to come out in 2023. Thank you. Um, and what are the implications of this, the results from this study for the operation and design of the planned WERF project? How will these results be used to either right size the plant or determine how much water you're going to treat? I'm assuming there is a relationship there. Um, I think there's a relationship there, but in terms of in, in terms of informing the design of the of, of the facility, um, I think what this, what this the intent of this plan was to take an independent look at 
all of the water supply options that the city of Morro Bay has in front of it. And the city of Morro Bay has two groundwater basins that it can utilize. Um, it's got the interesting alternative to discharge to Churro Creek. Um, it has a, one of the few communities that has a desal facility and a desal permit. And so um, our analysis was really to look at um, what is the best option for the city? What is, uh, from not just from a cost standpoint, but from a drought resiliency um, and from a permittability standpoint, what's the best option? And from that analysis, what we identified is IPR being the best option. Probably the next step for right sizing those um, IPR facilities will be the results of the um, hydrogeological work that uh, Council just authorized uh, last time. And th that study will, will right size that uh, component. Okay, yeah, I guess I'm wondering because if we rely primarily on state water as long as it's available, but we have now invested in indirect potable reuse, I'm just curious to know how much we're going to be using that part of the uh, project. Yeah, and, and as, 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 as Mr. Leivig mentioned, I think the, um, the most important thing there is the additional hydrogeo work that will show what is the long-term impacts of the injection of the water into the basin in terms of the nitrate concentration and then how much can be extracted. Okay. All right. as, as we discussed earlier today with our, our team, mm -hmm. uh, we talked about the, the IPR system will be likely to be used constantly to keep the nitrates flushed out of the system so that we can rely upon that water um, any time that we need it so that when we turn on that water supply, we have a clean water supply on demand. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Great, so I'm going to forego some of my questions, looking at the time and trying to get through that. We want to get through any kind of comments from council and uh, input from, from the, the document that we have before us. And I'll just lead off with some of my comments um, based on our comments, uh, conversations we had today as well. And then we'll look for um, the rest of council to make uh, their additional comments for this, this plan that um, you are so asking for. Um, first off, I... I just wanted to speak to, um, in, in our One Water Plan document before us, there's a kind of a historical uh, discussion on previous water and wastewater um, master plans that had taken place. And my question earlier today, and basically, um, the, um, I guess ask at this point, is to be able to summarize in the final draft document, um, uh, the benefits of our previous wa water and wastewater master plans that have taken plant taken place, um, in the effect that today we're we're really um, uh, positioned to be able to do a one water plan, and we have the rates and a CIP plan to implement everything. And if you can summarize in that document that to compare, it doesn't have to get into a, fi a real uh, uh, detailed analysis, but um, if you can summarize um, how those previous plans were um, uh, lacked the impl implement implementation portion of it, because as, as I understand it, we, we did go through those, but we didn't necessarily have the capital improvement program and the implementation um, availability that we have today. And I was just looking for maybe that sort of sure. input. And then um, on... Um, and then I didn't get to do this earlier, but I think that the sphere of influence map that we that's in this document, I'm not sure it it, def, it reflects our general plan LCP um, on that. I thought there was some discussion previously where our sphere of influence actually did or did not cover the tri W property. Rob, I'm kind of looking towards you on that, and if it's accurate, then we're good. But. Um. Our, in our current general plan, the SOI, sphere of influence, does go out around the entire, or is proposed to go out okay. ar around the entire um, 400 acres. LAFCO has to take action on that uh, request uh, for the increase of sphere. Okay, so as long as we're consistent, I just want to double check on that. And then, um, and then finally, um, as far as the stormwater, one of the other comments earlier today when we were talking is the stormwater portion of this document 
Um, we, you know, we lay out what the CIP does as far as culverts and things like that, but will it allow for development of policies that could um, address just things as far as pervious uh, surfaces, as we talked about, whether or not it's driveways, uh, expanding into streets, and things like that. So um, I'll, I'll conclude with my comments okay. on there and then look to the rest of council, uh, given the, the time, and I'll look to Red if he wants to start us off on comments. Sure, thanks. I just want to say that I'm very impressed with the level of detail in this plan and the thorough analysis that you have provided, and I feel comfortable moving forward because this, this answers two of my main questions that I always ask. We know what we're doing and why we're doing it. Thanks. Matt? And likewise, to piggyback with that, um, and that goes for um, you, Eric, and, and for staff also, in terms of going forward with the Wharf project with its one water plan, it may c creates a level of transparency that is going to really help us out a lot. So thank you. All right. John? Sure, thank you. Uh, I agree, and I would add that, you know, I, I, I believe as a city, this is prudent and responsible financial slash operational planning for capital allocation of dollars to our sewer and water system that has been long overdue, will serve us well in the future um, at a very reasonable cost. I also don't, I want to underline the fire safety benefit that this provides um, with regard to that. I, I'd like that to be highlighted um, in the report. I think that's significant and important to the community. Public safety is, is number one. And um, um, I just think the benefit there um, will be uh, something that we will uh, be very happy to have. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Marlos? Yeah. No, thank you very much. It was a great report, very thorough. And um, I did have some questions, which I, I will get answers to offline. Um, just a couple things that I noticed in the report that didn't quite make sense to me, so we can do that later. Um, any, if you can include anything in the report about other ways that we can use this study, uh, that would be great as well, um, because it is an excellent one, and and it, we just want to make sure we completely utilize the results of it. So thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks for those comments. Are we are thank we you. good with this? Okay. I think that concludes it. We'll be bringing um, an updated version of this to our Public Works Advisory Board on October 17th and then back to Council for the final report uh, November the 16th. Okay, great. Eric, Rob. Thank um, you very much. Joe and Damaris, thank you. Thanks very much. And with that, we'll adjourn this, take a short recess, and then come back to count our City Council meeting at 6 o'clock. Thanks very much.